Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Yes? Good? My name is Vincent, and my talk is titled, I Came In Like a Wrecking Ball. What's that? Closer? All right. My talk is titled, I Came In Like a Wrecking Ball. This talk is rated R. It's about hacking. I'd like to point out that some things in my talk today would be considered criminal activity should you not have the permission from your target. Who am I? I'm a penetration tester. I'm a small business owner. I'm an Air Force veteran. And when I'm not in front of a computer, I'm out in the desert training for a 100-mile ultramarathon. The things that are important to know about me, I've been in tech for over 30 years. I've been running a small technology business for the last 20 years. It started off as a break-fix IT company. And about 10 years ago, cloud started eating into our revenue, decided to pivot to security, took the OSCP course, fell in love with offense, and I've been doing that ever since. So what's this talk about? I work primarily with small businesses, so think 1,000 employees or less. The sweet spot is like 250 because they're big enough that they have stuff, but they're small enough that they're still very immature when it comes to security. So when we think about a big business, say a Bank of America, they have security teams. They run penetration tests. They have continuous vuln scans. They run red teaming exercises. They have layers and layers of security. And they have big bags of money to throw at the problem. Small businesses, on the other hand, are the low-hanging fruit. And this talk is about my adventures while working with small businesses. So it's story time. Probably not the only person in this room that has thought about how they would be a malicious actor, how they would acquire infrastructure, how they would remain uh, anonymous flying under the radar. So big picture, as I'm probably going to acquire some Wi-Fi, I'm going to use a privacy VPN. I'm going to go through the internet. I'm going to attack some infrastructure and compromise it and set up command and control. And then I'm going to attack a target. So on my wish list, I'm going to want some fake accounts, some burner laptops, burner phones, for your stolen Wi-Fi, and I'm going to use Tor and Tails and a privacy VPN. Privacy VPN providers say, we've got your back. We don't keep logs. We're not going to turn you into law enforcement. I'm like, is that really true? Because I have my ass basically turned over the logs for this lolsec hacker who is hacking out of his home on a privacy VPN. Then I saw this on, the, on Google. It says, can please uh, track your VPN traffic? Can they uh, break into encrypted traffic? And the thing that stood out to me was that if you were using Tor, Tails, or privacy VPN from your home, your ISP cannot see into that traffic, but they can see that you're using Tor, Tails, or a privacy VPN. And on that latter point, they can get the IP addresses, and they can figure out which provider, and then again, go back to that provider and force them to give the logs that they say that they don't keep. I'd like to remind you that hacking is a crime. So I thought it would be really interesting to get a hardware wallet and to put some crypto in it and maybe acquire some infrastructure. Truth be told, I don't own any crypto, and so this was kind of an exercise for me. Uh, so I fired this thing up. And then after many, many, many steps, I got my hardware wallet set up. Now I needed to put some crypto on it. And I found this Starbucks gift card in my card. And I looked it up, and it had $25 on it. And I thought, oh, if I could convert that and get that into crypto, then I could put that on that wallet. And then I could buy my infrastructure. So I found this website where you can convert gift cards to Bitcoin. This is going to work out great for me. So when I dug into it and actually tried to convert it, it says, we need to verify your ID. And basically, it wanted me to take a copy of my driver's license and send it into them, sort of defeating my purpose. And what I was running into is something called anti-money laundering and KYC, know your customer. Basically, the government doesn't want people doing bad things with crypto, so they're forcing these companies to um, get identification on the people that are trying to use their platforms. Now, at this point, I'm trying to remain anonymous, and I've got some ideas of how I can 
get crypto onto this wallet without giving up my driver's license. But I felt like I was crossing a line at that point. And I feel like this slide kind of emphasizes what I was thinking. <laughs> and ultimately, it's about OPSEC. So I'm trying to fly below the radar, and I feel like I'm going to draw attention to myself. And so this path was a dead end for me. So I decided to go to Molvad. Molvad is a privacy VPN provider out of Sweden. And what I think is really interesting about them is they take cash. You can take cash, stick it in an envelope, and you can mail it to Sweden. And in about a week, you get VPN service. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start setting up fake accounts. Now, mail.com is not an account that I would use for phishing because they would get uh, you know, basically identified as spam. But I need a backup email address for some other accounts, and mail.com is really good for that. And mail.com will allow you to use the sketchiest of sketchy email providers, like a disposable email service such as this one. And then I can get mail.com set up. And then at that point, my registration is set up, and it says, hey, thanks for signing up. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to LinkedIn, and I'm going to go to Outlook.com. Now, LinkedIn is owned by Microsoft, and in recent times, they are requiring an actual phone number for setting up accounts. So you can't use VoIP. You can't use um, you know, Google Voice. You have to use a real phone. And the reason why is they know that they have fake accounts, and I have a whole bunch of them, by the way. So I went and I bought myself a burner phone off of eBay. I found this unlocked iPhone. And the thing that I discovered is that it wants Wi-Fi, it wants email, and I felt like I couldn't set this up at my house because it was going to send that back to the Apple mothership, and then that would tie it back to me. Ultimately, what I wanted to do is I wanted to put this Mint Mobile card in there because I can get seven days of uh, mobile phone service with a real phone number for 99 cents. And then I ran into this chicken and egg situation. So in order to get Mint Mobile set up, I needed to have the app installed on the phone. In order to have the app installed on the phone, I needed a phone number and an email address for Apple. So I was sort of stuck. And then I started questioning, am I really a hacker? Because uh, when you look at what I use, I'm an iPhone user. Mac OS is my daily driver. And sometimes I use Nano instead of VI. What I ended up doing was I had a second burner phone. I found this phone in my box from when I went to DEF CON in 2013. And apparently, you can't go to DEF CON with your real phone because hackers are scary. Um, so I pulled out this old Android phone, which is probably what I should have used in the first place. Uh, I installed the app on there, and then I was able to get mobile set up. Next thing I want to do is I want to acquire some Wi-Fi. So I could go down to the mom and pop local coffee shop, or I could hack some Wi-Fi. And because I call myself a security researcher, I decided I would use my Flipper Zero. I got one of these recently, and I got the Wi-Fi dev board. And I thought, how cool would that to be, to be able to put this in a presentation? But it turns out the dev board only talks 2.4 gigahertz. So unless I'm going back into the 90s, I won't be hacking any Wi-Fi. So at that point, I decided to use the Wi-Fi Pineapple. If you don't know what this is, it's a tool that automates hacking Wi-Fi. And it makes it really easy, and it works great. And I use this in the real world. Um, oops, sorry. So the next thing I want to do is I want to enable recon mode. Now, I find that two minutes is actually a good time. Any shorter than that, it'll grab access points, but it won't grab connected devices. Any longer than that, you're just looking further out, and you're getting a more comprehensive look. So after two minutes, I find an access point, and I find a couple of connected devices. So I start a capture. Now, at this point, I can hit the deauth button. By the way, not a lawyer. So if you do not have permission from your target, I'm pretty sure hitting deauth is a crime. I actually have permission, so I hit the deauth button. And after that, I captured the handshake, and I downloaded the PCAP. So we need to convert this to something that we can crack with Hashcat. And if you didn't know what you were looking at, you could go to the Hashcat examples site, and it would tell you that mode 2500 is what we need to use to capture this handshake. So when we run mode 2500, it says 2500 is deprecated. Use 22,000. 22,000 doesn't work, by the way. But we can use this flag, deprecated, check, disable. And then if the client has a bad password or it's weak, um, which they did, we crack it, which you see masked at the top. 
So at this point, I'm ready for my attack. Now, I want some infrastructure. And there's no shortage of infrastructure on the internet. This is a recent Nessa scan, and I found Log4j. It's been 18 months since Log4j has been uh, discovered, and yet I'm still finding it. And if not, there's always WordPress. There are plenty of vulnerable WordPress servers on the internet, and you can hack them and take them over uh, for your command and control. So this is how I feel. I'm in the center. I've got my tentacles out. I've got my command and control, and I'm ready to go to work. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start fishing. Now, in my day job, I fish for offense and for defense. And for defense, I'm talking about security awareness, uh, basically running quarterly you know, campaigns, kind of that bottom of the barrel, you know, the fake DHL, that kind of thing. So some clients don't really take fishing seriously. Um, this client got popped, and then they decided to run some awareness training but they didn't really take it to a real level where it worked. Um, this was their version of security awareness training. It says, over the past few months, we've been running an internal phishing audit campaign and it's been brought to my attention that we've had some pretty close calls. They did, they got phished. And this is more of their security awareness training. Don't click on links. This is super helpful. And this is the kind of fish that we're talking about. So here's this financials report has been shared with you. It's kind of generic comes from corp-internal.us, and there's this guy, Steven. Steven clicks on all the links, by the way. And what's really interesting about Steven is Steven doesn't have anything to do with finance. So Steven is just nosy, and I didn't feel the need to bring that to their attention, but Steven should probably get fired. Um, and then here is more of their security awareness training. Bad email that was opened by Steven. He has received his 100 lashes for doing so. This is a quality program they're running here. All right, now on the offense front, I'm fishing to win. And in recent times, there have been some obstacles that have been thrown in my way, in particular, Mark of the Web. So if you don't know what Mark of the Web is, this is a doc that I sent through email. And down at the bottom, it's stamped with this. This file came from another computer and might be blocked to help protect this computer. Basically, what that means for me is I can no longer use macros. So I started packing up Word docs in ISO files. This is not an original thought. I stole it from APTs. Basically, if you don't know what an ISO file is, it's a single electronic file that contains the identical content of an optical disk. So you take a DVD or a CD, you stick it in your computer, you rip it. It's going to make an ISO file or an image file. So basically, I pack up this Word doc inside this ISO file. And then when I send it, the ISO file gets stamped with, sorry, with the mark of the web but it doesn't hinder its ability to function. So when we launch this ISO, it mounts resume.doc, and when we extract it, there is no mark of the web, which means I have macros again. So now I want to talk about Microsoft Word. I ask myself, what is a docx file? And it turns out a docx file is a collection of files that are zipped up, and it's named docx. So I started reading into this because I wanted to know more about this. And it turns out we can add files to this collection. In particular, we can add these footer files. So I decided that I could put in a URL for this include picture. And I basically have it pointing at, a, at my attacking server where I've got some PHP hosted. So we need to make this change in two locations. And basically, here's the second, again, referencing that, that command and control server. So this is some ghetto PHP. Basically, it's just pulling user agent information and it's outputting it to a file. If we hit this straight up, we basically see the date stamp, IP address, uh, users running Windows 10, architecture 64-bit, and they're running Firefox. And then when we output the file, we basically see the same thing. So I can fish a bunch of users, and I can collect this into a file, and then I can go back and I can say, hey, I got all these users. Uh, if I didn't care about my clients, I could use webhook.site. Basically, it will do all the hosting for you. Uh, I just don't feel comfortable pushing my clients to some rando site, but if you wanted to play with this, here's a, a place where you could do that. And basically, we get the same thing. We get the user agent information. And you're saying, so what? That's true. You can pull that information from the logs on an Apache server. So I decided to weaponize it. So what I have here is a UNC path. And if you're not familiar with UNC paths, uh, you work in a corporate environment, you're on a Windows system, you've got a Windows server, you're mapping to drives. 
uh, you're going to use the UNC path. It's going to be backslash, backslash, server name, backslash, share name. So I have this pointing at my attacking server. So I want to take a quick sidebar. Sometimes I need to create a logo. And Adobe has this website where you can create logos for free. It takes about five minutes. So I say my awesome business is called Conspiracy Inc. And my slogan is birds aren't real. And then it will give me a bunch of different you know, logos. And I find this one that I like. And, uh, and so now we're going back to what we were talking about before. So game on. And the reason why I brought this up is I have this email where I'm going to start my phishing campaign. And I've got my malicious document. And I say, please quote the following. And down at the bottom, I've got this nice signature block with a logo. I have found a very high success rate from putting a signature block and a nice little image like that. It's, it throws it through the roof. Uh, so I will do this with, you know, when I'm getting serious, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, and in this client in particular, I was testing Proofpoint. So my document ended up in the attachment sandbox. And if you don't know what this is, the attachment sandbox, it'll take the document, it'll open it up, it'll see if it explodes. And if it doesn't, it'll close it back up and ship it off to the recipient. It actually made it through proof point, which is what we see in the right-hand column. So this malicious document went through an anti-phishing solution. And then it started raining hashes, more hashes, and even more hashes. So let me ask you a question. What is more impactful? This pie chart, where I have critical, high, medium, and low vulnerabilities, or the fact that your user responded to the attacker because they didn't think it was suspicious that they opened up a blank Word document. He says, hello, there are no company part numbers appearing anywhere in this email or attachment. Please provide readable inquiry. And I actually went back and forth with him, which was hilarious. Now I want to talk about shortcuts. And we've all seen these. They're on the desktop. It's a little image. Got a little arrow. Indicates a shortcut. It's actually a file that ends in .url. And when we look inside of this file, there's a reference for icon file. Icon file is that picture that we see. Now, what I want to point out, we don't have to do anything to get it to look for the icon file. It's the act of opening up to that destination that causes it to look for it. So I threw in a UNC path for my attacking server. And then I'm firing up a man in the middle tool called Responder. And so I test this out. I open up to the location, and I get hashes. So now I pack this up into an ISO file. Now, in recent times, they've caught on to this trick with the ISO files, so they've blocked this across the mail providers. This is Office 365, and it says, hey, you can't attach this. And I said, OK, how about if I zip it up? So I've got the URL file inside of an ISO inside of a zip file. So when I open up that zip file, it actually looks inside the ISO file, and I get a hash. And if it didn't, it wouldn't matter, because when I mount it, I still get a hash. So now I'm ready for my live fire exercise. So I fire up Responder. And then I have my zip file with my malicious document. And I say, please quote the following. And then it starts raining hashes and more hashes. And I love hashes. Now I want to talk about Proofpoint specifically. Proofpoint is an anti-phishing solution. I have no relationship with them other than I use it. And sometimes I frequently test it. Um, but I was sitting in front of my computer the other day, and the Proofpoint Quarantine Digest showed up in my inbox. And I thought for a second, this thing hits my inbox every morning, and I've become so accustomed to it that I've actually stopped looking to see where it's coming from. So I decided to close the page, started an email, and I sent it out to all the clients that we manage. I fished 137 users, and I got hashes. And I'm obsessed with hashes. And the reason why is because I like password cracking. So in a Windows environment, if you enable password complexity, you need a minimum of eight characters. You need an uppercase, a lowercase, a number, number, and a special character. And I actually believe it's three of the four of those. And that is not complex enough. So I will pull hashes. And I have a very modest cracking machine. It's an old precision workstation with a single GPU. And I'm still good for cracking about 20%. So we've got 123Faith. we got Hot Rock 65. we got Freedom 895 and Squats 185. 
So then I use a tool called Crack Map Exec, and I start spraying the environment with usernames and passwords. Now, the interesting thing about this client in particular is they were actually running a sim, and it did not detect that anomalous activity. So I'm like, anybody home? So I get a hit. I get this user and Fremont895 as the password. I start enumerating the environment, and I find that this user has access to the accounting folder. So I dig into accounting, and I find accounts payable. Then I find AP passwords, an Excel document. And I love it when people give file names passwords, because that's gold for me. So I dig into it, and I find a bunch of usernames and passwords and accounts for uh, UPS, FedEx, and DHL. And I know how I'm mailing my Christmas presents this year. Now I want to talk about me and my shadow. So sometimes I need to get onto a user's desktop through remote desktop. And Previously, what I would do is I would actually wait until it was after hours and I would jump in because if a user is on their system and you hop into their system, it's going to alert them and that's going to get me busted. But I learned about something called shadow mode. So we enable this in the registry and then when we see an active session, we can enable shadow mode with no consent prompt. So basically, I can bounce into this user session and they don't know that I'm there. So I'm basically shadowing this user, and I watch them log into Wells Fargo, and I screenshot that, and then I watch, log them, or I watch them log into this, or open up this document that has the uh, general ledger account breakdown, and then basically heads were exploding. Now I want to talk about Defender. If you are old like me, you know that Defender is a video game, and it is not an antivirus solution. And I'm not talking about Defender ATP. I'm just talking about Plain Jane Defender. So I started an engagement, and I asked them, what endpoint protection are you running? And they said, we're running Defender. And I told them, I will prove why that is a bad idea. So I drop a interpreter reverse shell onto this system, and it says the file contains a virus. So did good there. But then I convert that shell to hex, and I drop that hex on the system, and Defender doesn't do anything. So I'm using a technique called process injection. And basically what this is is I take an existing process and I part the memory of that process. I inject this shell code and then I execute it in memory. And what I get back is a reverse shell. And then I start enumerating the environment and I run a ping sweep and basically proving to them why they shouldn't be using Windows Defender as their antivirus. Another thing I need to prove is uh, you need to stop giving your users local admin. If you give your users local admin, I'm going to wreck you. It's typically the engineers and the developers. These guys are like, hey, if we don't have local admin access, everything's going to break. We're not going to be productive. That's not true. Um, basically, what you want to do is you want to give your, your users domain users accounts. Let them operate as regular users. And then when they need to have privileged access, they have a local account that they can use to log in and log out, or sometimes you just get a prompt. That's how you should operate, and that's how you would stop me. So here I am. I'm on a system where I have local admin, and I enable WDigest. If you don't know what WDigest is, it stores clear text credentials in memory. So the next thing I'm going to do is, from Task Manager, I'm going to dump LSAS. LSAS is where these hashes and, and clear text credentials are stored in memory. So I go to create a dump file, but I get 0k. And I think that's interesting, because this worked not too long ago, but I feel like maybe they've sewed this up. So I use a tool called proc dump, because I can basically do the same thing from the command line, but I get error writing to dump file. I'm like, oh, they're actually closing up my holes here. So then I decide I'm going to use uh, volume shadow copy, and I run the create command, and it says invalid command. So they're actually closing up my holes, and I'm learning it in this engagement. So I try process injection, and I get a shell back, but when I check my ID, I'm expecting it to be NT authority system, but I'm not. I'm this user audit, which means I can't dump hashes. And at that point, I'm getting a little sad, and I'm like, womp, womp. And then my imposter syndrome kicks in. And I'm pretty sure I'm not the only person in this room that has imposter syndrome, but I'm questioning, you know, am I really a hacker? Am I good at what I'm doing? 
And I mentioned this to a friend of mine, and he recommended this book called The Secret Thoughts of Successful Women. It's not about women. It's about imposter syndrome. If you're like me, it's actually a pretty good read. Um, I went to go take a picture of the book. thought it was pretty funny that it was sitting underneath adversarial tradecraft and cybersecurity. So while I'm improving on being a better me, I'm also improving on being a better hacker. And then I feel like we're keeping score. And it's Gates 1 and Vincent 0. So then I decide I'm going to schedule a task. I'm going to run that task as NT authority system. And I'm going to run that process injection. So when I get my shell back, now I'm system. And I can run Kiwi. And when I dump creds all down at the bottom, we see that I have the clear text credential uh, from that logged in user. So basically proving you know, why you shouldn't give your users local admin, although it took a long way to get there. And in my game, I get points back, and it's Vincent 1 and Gates 0. Sometimes I'm asked to establish persistence. So basically, get into the environment, but if we boot you out, you need to get back in. So this is some ghetto PowerShell. Basically, it's a reverse shell. So I test it, and I get a connection back. So now I'm going to convert it to an executable. And when I dump that to the system, they're running Bitdefender Gravity Zone, which actually detected it. So, OK. So how about if I can download that shell and execute it in memory? So that's what we see here. And I get a shell back. OK. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that download and execute, and I'm going to convert that to an executable. So here's psdxe. I output to the executable. I test it, and I get my shell back. So now I'm going to schedule a task that's going to run every hour, and it's going to execute that download and execute. So I get booted out of the environment. An hour later, I get back in the environment. So I've established persistence. And that was kind of lame. I know. So I'm going to use something called RID hijacking. RID stands for relative ID. I'm going to create a user account, ASP.NET 4.0. Now, ASP.NET is a legitimate account. And I've, I was a system administrator for a number of years. So if I saw ASP.NET 4.0, I would think that that is a legitimate account. And I certainly wouldn't delete it because I would be afraid it would break .NET. Next thing I need is the ID for this account. Users start at 1,000, and my user is 1,008. I want to point out that the administrator account is 500. So I need to convert this to hex, so 03F0. Now I need to launch a command prompt as NT authority system. So I'm using PS exec. Check my who am I system. And now I can launch regedit. And the reason why is because as a regular user or an even administrator, we cannot get to this portion of the registry. But as system, we can. So what I have highlighted here is the administrator account. And we see uh, that we're 01F4. And then our ASP.NET account is uh, 03F0. So I'm modifying that to match the admin account. And this, this is showing you down at the bottom 03F0, but we have the identifier of the admin. So when we go to log in, we check the administrators group, and we're not in there. But when we run administrative commands, we can. So basically, I have what looks to be a user, but it's actually an admin. So this is kind of a stealthy way uh, to stay below the radar. Now, I want to update. In recent times, this stopped working in Windows 10. I think they figured this out, and they've closed this up. So another method uh, for persistence is something called sticky keys. If you are old and blind like me, uh, maybe you can't see when you log into Windows. If you hit Shift five times, you get to accessibility options. And that is tied to sethc.exe. So first thing I want to do is I want to take ownership of this file. Then I want to modify access control on this file. Because I like my clients, I'm making a backup copy of this file. And then what I want to do is I want to copy command.exe to sethc.exe. But I get access is denied. It's like, that's interesting. So I elevate my command prompt to system, and I try again, and I get access denied. Point I'm making here is that I've been doing this for a long time. What I did five years ago is not what I was doing last year and is not what I'm doing right now. I have this idea. I want to use sticky keys. And they've closed up this hole. But maybe there's another way that I can go about this. And it turns out there is. And it's actually much better. First thing that we need to do is we need to disable antivirus. And then what we're doing is we're tying the, de the debugger to C, and we're going to launch command prompt. 
So basically, we get to the login prompt, and we hit Shift five times. Now it's launching command prompt instead of accessibility options. And when we check who am I, we're NT authority system. So I don't even need any accounts on this system. I can get to a command prompt before I log in, and I can start creating accounts. All right, now I want to get into story time. So I have permission to talk about my clients in my conference talks, but apparently they don't necessarily know what that actually means. And one of my clients was in the audience and was like, OK, you can't talk about us anymore. So instead of using them, I created this fictitious company called Nortech.com. I started my engagement. I went to Dehashed. If you're not familiar with Dehashed, it is a large data breach collection. I pay $150 a year for full access to this. So I put in my client's domain name, and I get 154 results. And what you're going to get are usernames, passwords, hashes, personal information, whatever, whatever has been breached. So I find this user, Nico Bianchi, and I've got a hash. And I take all of the hashes that I find for NerdTech, and I run Hashcat across them, and I find that Nico likes Pizza Pass 1. Next thing I want to do is I want to figure out what mail provider they're using. They're using Office 365. And because they don't use 2FA, and because Nico likes to reuse his passwords, I logged into Nico's mailbox. The first thing I do is I fish everybody in the company, because why not? Next thing I do is I start digging through Nico's mailbox, and I find an open VPN connection pack. And because they don't use passphrases or 2FA, I logged into their environment, and I started enumerating. And heads were exploding. Next thing I want to talk about is building a better password. Now that is a really strong password. And you should put that someplace safe. So I start my engagement. I'm enumerating my client's environment, and I find this Microsoft SQL Server. I'd already compromised a user, and so I looked at SMB shares, and I found this E2 shop system. If you don't know what E2 is, it's like job boss, ERP, MRP. So I dig into this share, start digging in further, and I find this DB scripts folder. And the thing that stands out to me is user.sql. So I open this up, and what do I find? That really strong password. And I'm like, I can't believe you have this fantastic password, and you just left that in the file system for any user to find. I get most of my exercise these days from shaking my head in disbelief. <laughs> so I use Microsoft SQL Server Client. I point it at that server. I log in as the user. And then next thing I do is I enable XP command shell. I execute who am I, and I'm NT service Microsoft SQL Server. I run who am I slash priv, and I see SE impersonate privilege. That sticks out to me because if you are a hacker, you are familiar with print spoofer, and you know that SE impersonate privilege is what we need to use for that. Because I don't like running random stuff from the internet in my client's environment, um, I've used that. I've used Prince Poofer in labs and you know, and like hack the box, and it works great. But I just don't feel comfortable running that in my client's environment. So I pointed out to them in my report, hey, if I were a bad person, this would be my next step. My actual next step was uh, I dumped the reverse shell to the system, and I was able to get that on the system, but I wasn't able to execute it. So in my reports, I typically will show them things that are good and things that are bad. So I said, like, hey, look, it detected me, so that's great. Next thing I did was I launched Squish, SQL Server Shell, connected to the database, and I dumped the user code database where I have usernames and hashes. And I pointed this one out specifically because this is the vice president of the company, and I figured that would freak him out. And there were explosions. As a bonus prize, I wanted to show insider threat. So in this environment, they actually restrict their users to regular user access. So nobody in the company has uh, admin access. And even the domain ad admins operate as a regular user, but they have an account that they will bounce into when they want to do privileged stuff. So I couldn't install anything on this system, but Heidi SQL makes a portable version that's an executable that they could launch. 
So I'm logged in as a regular user in their domain, and I fire up Heidi SQL, and I point it to that SQL server with that really strong password. And I start you know, digging into the databases, and then I find the user code database, and I want to see how they designate uh, administrators. And basically, it's this user group code where we have admin. So then I send an email to my client, and I said, hey, can you create a regular user account for me in E2? And he says, does it need any special permission or anything, or is it just to see if you can break into it? I'm like, if? I already broke into it. So there's my account, and my designation is sales, which is the bottom, uh, the bottom tier of the group codes. So I changed that to admin, and it turns out there was another field that I needed to modify, user group code ID. Uh, 2256 is how they designate admins. Then I was able to log in to E2, and I have full privilege here. So E2 for this company is everything. It's their accounting system. So I was literally showing them, like, hey, here's my purchase order, and I can change the price of you know, my project here. They didn't think that was great. And they were upset. Now I want to talk about dehashed domain admin. So I start my engagement, and again, I'm always looking at dehashed, because you can gather information about the client in advance of the engagement. So I search on the company name, and the thing that stands out is it at companyname.com. I tried to credential stuff this everywhere. So every account place that I could find, I was like trying to, trying to get this in there, and it didn't work. But sometimes I feel like I'm building a puzzle, and that felt like a special piece. So I took that and stuck it over in this corner pile over here. Next thing I did is I used crack map exec, and I'm looking for SMB signing set to false. If you don't know what SMB signing is, uh, it's a security mechanism in the SMB protocol. Basically, if someone tampers with SMB traffic, it's going to know and it's going to drop the traffic. So if you have signing set for true, then I can't do man in the middle attacks. Now, what's really interesting about this server that showed false is that they have a group policy that enables SMB signing, but for some reason it didn't stick on this server. So this is a reason why you should audit your environments, because sometimes you think something is one way and it's another. But I couldn't do anything with that, but it felt like another important piece to this puzzle. So I stuck it over in the pile. I'm enumerating their environment, and I find this HP page-wide color flow multi-scanner copier. Now, if you know me, you know that I love copiers. When I get into your environment, first thing I'm hunting for is copiers. Because people don't think, OK, I won't touch anything. People don't trust, you know, people don't uh, like basically give scanners, these multifunction copiers, the respect that they need. A lot of times outside vendors come in and install them, and IT don't, won't put hands on them. The reason why you should protect these things is because they have scan to file and scan to email function. They have credentials. And oftentimes what I find is that instead of giving specific uh, access to maybe user home folders or whatever, they'll create a domain admin account, make that the scanner account, and basically that scanner can scan into the entire file system. So I am hunting for these like mad. So I find this, and typically I can go to Google and I can find default credentials. So uh, oftentimes you'll see that the credentials are 123456 or 11111. The HP is actually a decent scanner. It does not have a default credential. It gets set up at the time uh, when you install this. However, that piece of the puzzle comes into play, and that IT password was what got me logged into this system. So here I am. I'm logged in, and I see that they run scan to file. So I dig into this scans, and I find that it's pointing to a file server. Now, the other interesting thing about uh, these multifunction scanners is when you modify the, uh, the path or modify anything in here, it doesn't blank out the password and make you put it back in. It just saves it in there. So I fire up Responder, and then I change this, and I point it to my attacking server, and I hit Verify Access. Now, I was expecting an inbound connection on Responder, but I didn't get anything, and I thought that was kind of odd. So I fire up Netcat, and what I realized is that they, they actually have SMB1 disabled in the environment, so good for them. And again, something that I pointed out, this is good. So then I point it to my other attacking server where I've got Metasploit set up. 
and I get an inbound connection from that scanner, and I've got the scanner account and the NTLM v2 hash. But I can't crack the hash. And then I remember my puzzle. Because that system has signing disabled, I can do a man in the middle attack. So basically what I'm doing is I'm relaying those credentials from that scanner through my attacking system to that file server where signing is disabled. So I fire up NTLM Relay X, I enable SMB2 support, and what I get is a dump of the local SAM database and I have the administrator account and hash. So now I'm using PS exec, and I don't even need the password. I can pass that hash. So I pass it to that file server, and basically down at the bottom what we see is now I have a shell on that system. They were not running endpoint protection on this system because they thought that because it's a file server, that antivirus would slow it down and cause people to get angry. Now I want to point out that this server is running 20, or it's running server 2016. And the reason why that's important is because earlier I was unable to dump LSAS on Windows 10, but on server 2016, I can run uh, proc dump and dump LSAS. So there's some inconsistencies in the operating systems. And you know, as an attacker, I'm gonna try, as long as I don't think I'm gonna get detected, I'm gonna try everything because it might work. I have no idea. Um, and so in this situation, uh, it didn't work in Windows 10, but I tried it on server 2016, it did work. So I have the dump file. And because they're not running endpoint protection, I could pull Mimikatz straight to this system. And I run Mimikatz on that dump file. And what we see down at the bottom is the administrator domain account and hash. I think I know where the domain controller is. I think it's on dot .143. I do an NS lookup and I confirm that it's on 143. So I run crack map exec. I point it uh, to the domain controller with that administrator account and hash. And in the bottom right hand corner, uh, we see pwned, which means that I've just compromised the entire domain. Boom. So I've given a similar talk over the last three years. And at the end of the talk, I want to offer solutions, right? Because I just talk about beating people up, try to be helpful. Uh, seems like I've been offering the same solutions the last three years. So talk about gamify security. Your users don't care if bad things happen to their workstations or their corporate network. They're, they're not concerned at all. So what I found to be very successful is to get them engaged by gamifying it. Um, so just a specific, a specific example with like phishing, what we'll do is we'll say, all right, um, we had you know, this many users click links, um, this many users gave up their credentials. Let's see if we can lower that by X percent, or like get the overall number down. And if we can do that, then everybody in the company gets a Starbucks gift card. You know, back before COVID, we used to have these rubber, we give them rubber fish, put them in a fishbowl, and then people would collect fish, and they would be, oh, I'm beating you because I have more fish in my fishbowl. Anything you can do to get them engaged, get them engaged. Um, password managers and 2FA, been beating this dead horse for a long time, and yet I still go into environments where, where they're not using either. Um, and if you did that, you would stop me a lot. Uh, antivirus to EDR. If you don't know what EDR is, it's endpoint detect and respond. It's fancy antivirus. Um, detects anomalous activity, um, not just malicious. Um, and then SIM, I mentioned that earlier, security information event management. It is a giant log aggregate and it will trigger alerts on anomalous activity. So a lot of the things that I did, anomalous activity, I would have gotten detected if there was a SIM. So again, been making these recommendations for the last few years. See a little bit of traction, um, but not a huge amount. What I have found to be very successful over the last year is actually collaborating with the internal team. So nobody wants a pen tester in their environment. They think, you're gonna un unearth our skeletons, you're gonna make us look bad. Try not to make you look bad, but I'm certainly gonna unearth your skeletons. But what I do is I tell them, hey look, I'm gonna come into your environment, I'm gonna run a pen test. And then after that, we're going to work together as a team and we're going to test your controls. And then I'm going to give you suggestions to make this a, you know, a more secure environment. Because that's our goal. Like my goal is to make them more secure. 
Um, so I'm trying to help them. And I feel like that's actually been very successful in, in getting uh, a little more adoption of uh, some of the things that I'm recommending. So with that, I'm going to say this is the end. I'm going to throw it out for questions. And there's my contact information. So any questions? Uh, no, actually, I have not. Um, and I'm just trying to think. I mean, most of the clients that we work with are, are really small, uh, typically a flat network. Um, and basically, there's, you know, Jimmy, the IT guy, that's the, you know, he's the de facto IT guy. Um, that's typically what we're looking for because we can show a lot of value in what we're doing. Well, I'm, I'm pulling, N I mean, so I was pulling NTLM hashes when I was cracking them, but I was pulling NTLM v2. That would not have stopped me. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, I, I, I caught, heard flat network. I mean, I'm going to try to pivot through those segments, and I have, I mean, I've run into places where there's, where there are some, you know, different segments, but I'm just going to try to figure out how I can get through, if I can get through. But typically, again, it's just, it's usually just one big giant network. Uh, a lot of times what I'll see is it's, um, you know, slash 23, because they have so many IPs in the network, but they're still trying to create this one giant network. Anyone else? All right. Thank you very much.